that's it. You guys are on. We are. We are. Yeah. Well, Bob Solomon and Bob Turnbull, thank you so much for coming. This is our Pleasure. second uh, oral history uh, filming. And um, what we're looking at, we're looking at our members who joined back in the 60s. And I know that Bob Solomon, you joined in 62, and Bob, you were in 64. Right. So what we're curious about, oral history is what we remember. Because sometimes we don't remember or we remember wrong, and it all doesn't matter. But we're curious, I'm curious, when you became members, what was the proceedings back then, and what, as far as becoming the member, were there a membership committee, were you interviewed, were you posted, <laughs> sort of like this today, or was it? Uh, and what brought you to the Corinthian Yacht Club? Who wants to go first? Ooh. You came first. <coughs> well, actually, I joined in 62 but I came into the harbor in 58. Uh, I had a, uh, bought a floor blue. Uh, that was a 27-foot English design Taiwan built boat, and we had a class in the bay. Mm. And uh, I had uh, uh, become interested in in uh, racing because I had a neighbor, Ted McCarthy, who had a, a Rhodes 33 next door, and I crewed for him. Ooh. And uh, I decided that uh, uh, I, uh, that was my sport. I had a friend, I was in the Naval Reserve. Uh, I, I'm a, a World War II vet and a Korean vet, and uh, I decided to uh, uh, join the reserves to get promoted to a, 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 rate, a rank that uh, would not get called back in for these all these wars that we were having every six years. And so uh, this will explain other things that I'm going to tell you about, but uh, uh, I uh, bought my boat in and uh, I was on D-13, which was the end of the line at that point. There was no outboard uh, finger, it was just the dolphin there. Uh -huh. And so I was a target for all the drunks that were leaving <laughs> Sam's dock under sail. Uh -huh. I had a guy in the Columbia 50 sail out and he was between my port starboard quarter and the, and the dolphin and I commented that I didn't think he was going to fit through uh -huh. there. Uh, so anyway, uh, I was there for four years. Remember Frank Brooks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Oh, he was in charge of the harbor, and he came up to me one day. And he said, "Bob, uh, if you don't join the club, we're going to throw you out of here." So I joined the club. That was my interview uh, <laughs> of the membership committee. And that was it. That was it. That was it. I just came up there, signed up, and gave him some money. Do you remember how much money? <laughs> no, I could go back to my checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it wasn't a huge sum. Uh, nothing, money, no money were, were huge in those days. No, sure. And we'll, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, uh, I joined my, my friend Bob Christensen from next door uh, uh, provided the membership requirements that the YRA had that you had to belong to a club to race. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't need a club. I had four kids at home that that was my club. And uh, uh, I'm really not a big drinker. And a lot of the activities around the club were started in the bar. That was a, that was one big committee. Of, uh, so I had uh, I had a neighbor of mine, uh, three bursts down, Ed Wade, mm -hmm. who was the Commodore, 
in 62. And uh, he, uh, he asked me to be secretary. So that was another interview that I had. And uh, I asked him one time later on, uh, uh, Ed had a bare bone, sugar foot. And then he later got a Triton, named it after his wife. He was a San Francisco fellow. And I asked him one day why he asked me to be secretary. And I, he said, because you kept your boat up so well. <laughs> so that was another <laughs> committee hearing of why I became secretary. So, so 1963, I was secretary. Uh, I, I'd do anything for it. He was just a swell guy. He was a uh, uh, branch manager of NCR. How many years were you secretary? I was secretary for four years. And then in uh, C two, two, three, four, five, six, and then in seven, I went on. They asked me to become a member of the board because I'd been going on board meeting for so <laughs> so long that I was aware of the flow of the club business, and uh, the same is happening. The same yeah, is happening today. Sure, I, I had uh, so I had four years of background yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I was a member of the board for two years, and then uh, there was some commotion, uh, because I would have been around your time, about what happened to the rear commodore, and it was, I was going to look into it as to why I didn't come in as rear commodore, because I was primarily interested in racing, and, uh, and instead they made me a vice commodore uh, right off, and so I was in charge of the ballroom and the dining room and all that stuff um, when it was much different than it was today and uh, I, I learned one thing that uh, uh, it taught me and that is I'd probably never get into the food business. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that was not exactly where you were. You were on the racing end of the sailing, yeah. not really in food. Uh, and my business was uh, uh, in IBM. So, uh, anyway, with that background. Well, there's some commonality there with Ed Wade. I know people that worked for him at NCR and he had a reputation as a uh, salesman extraordinaire. He was branch manager and uh, uh, he was, he has a wonderful wife and a daughter, two daughters, both adopted. And uh, one of them was the one that was murdered in that uh, uh, episode up in Victoria, they were, she was living aboard the boat and somebody oh. came and killed her. <clears throat> so that was pretty tough on them, but uh, Ed was a wonderful fellow to uh, be secretary for. Yeah. Yes. You were saying that uh, you, you sort of got thrown into the social side of things with your interest really being more on racing, but you said in those days it was uh, considerably different. What, how would you characterize then and now in terms from the social standpoint and the, you know, the club from that aspect? Things were managed more informally uh, than they are today. Uh, uh, we did a lot of things that we talk about out in the harbor among the, primarily among the racers. Uh, today we have more formal committee work, uh, and uh, I was just hearing from <coughs> from Lynn about uh, uh, how they're organizing this uh, uh, fundraising for uh, the uh, endowment, endowment fund. Endowment. Yeah, and it's the first time I've had for instance, uh, any communication with regard to the endowment fund. I, I knew it existed, but, but as I say, I don't get much information from the club anymore. We used to have a formal uh, paper that went out, and then it was automated, and and uh, somehow or other, I I must have hit a wrong key, and I 
I disengaged myself from. You deleted yourself. <laughs> Pardon? I said you deleted, deleted yourself. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Len gave me the secret to get reinstated, and it never, uh, I just never made it work. And uh, by that time, I was out of the mainstream and so forth. But anyway, getting back to uh, uh, when I was on the board, I learned a lot about the club as secretary that I hadn't been aware of uh, because I didn't interact at all uh, with my kids, and I'm not a barman. Uh, so that's how a lot of things got done. That uh, If you were in the bar, the people that were the noisiest uh, asked questions, and then things took off from there. But, but Bob, uh, did you still have, I mean, you still had, like you say, you were secretary, so there was still the board meeting, there was still the flag, and the yeah. board with yeah. regular meeting, sort yeah. of like it is today. The, the format was there. Yeah, yes. Um, and I, uh, then I became vice governor and in charge of the dining room, and of course I was vastly uh, overwhelmed with, uh, <laughs> with food uh, and everything associated with the dining room. Uh, I'm trying to think about that time. I think we did a big uh, rehab of the dining room uh, with you hired uh, an architect who I was in a carpool with, oh. Dick Olmsted from Hooper, Olmsted and Emmons. And Audrey Emmons was married to uh, Don Emmons, who was an eminent uh, architect in the Bay Area. Uh, and she was the one that that redecorated the dining room with that that uh, red velvet. Oh, I read, yeah, I read about the red See? velvet. Everybody remembers it's, the red ball. Oh God, it's, yes. it's, it's, it, it it sort of had a little bit of a bordello look. Would you say? <laughs> you might say that. <laughs> well, who, who am I to argue with? Right. <laughs> but Audrey was quite a gal. And, uh, and a racer, I might add. Uh, that's how I got to know people. If they raced the boat, I probably knew sure. them. <laughs> right. But you were, so you came, you came in and you became vice commodore. Yes. And, and I, that was it. I, well, I, uh, I mentioned that I was in the reserves, which is how I was going to weave that in. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, when it came to, uh, uh, I got a call in uh, July from the nominating committee as to whether I was going to be going up to Commodore. And in June, I had uh, been promoted to group commander of all the reserve divisions at Hunter's Point. Oh. So I had 27 reserve divisions to manage, and I had been doing this for some time as a staff, uh, chief staff officer for the group commander. And then I became a group commander. So that been a lot of weekends, plus my racing weekends, and I'm thinking, when the hell am I going to go down the club and run the club? Because that's when sure. it's all done. Sure, sure. So I explained this to the nominating committee guy, and I said, hey, I'll, I'll go up uh, if, if uh, you, on the understanding that I, my Saturdays at the club will be limited, is I think the way I put it. And uh, I never heard from him again. Mm. <laughs> so so I, 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 I realized I was not going to be Commodore, okay. which didn't break my heart. Okay, yeah. but, that was uh, my next question. I, well, uh, some people, my close friends asked me how come I was passed over. <laughs> and uh, I, never, uh, I never considered that. I just figured that uh, they wanted me to be there on the weekends and I was not available between between Hunter's Point and racing. They uh, thought you hadn't, to put it in modern times, you hadn't passed the the FBI investigation. Well, I, I really <laughs> never looked at it that way because I really didn't give a damn whether yeah. I was Commodore or not, frankly. Uh, it wasn't my main interest in the club. Right. Uh, you know, going back to food service for a moment, when with the dining room, um, 
Did, did we hire our, our own chef at the time, or did we outsource? What, what was the situation? <laughs> that was one of my star <laughs> moments, trying to keep the dining room going with the staff. And uh, because I didn't know the community, when you know the community, uh, first of all, you don't explore things that are ridiculous because you don't know they're ridiculous. And so it was a learning curve. And uh, so I felt like I was kind of thrown into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did the best I could, but you know, you step up one weekend and, and uh, uh, there's a good crowd there and you only have two waitresses and, uh, and trouble with the cooks and whatnot. And so the next week you cut back or, or you Vice versa. Thank you. No problem. Um, it, it was hard to, because the dining room crowd was not steady. It was very deep valleys and yeah, I, I, I just remember, I mean, this is starting in 69. Yeah. I just remember the food and the chefs. Uh, it was not something you would. Right. We were very <laughs> no, it was well, by 69, I thought they'd had it cleaned up, but uh, it was okay, so to speak. Uh, so to at speak. least in the galley management, uh, and you know, I never, I'd never run an operation like that before. So, uh, in in the Navy, I was, I was a gunnery officer, so I, I was not to my expertise. Right. <laughs> so, so, Bob, I'm looking at you were talking about. Remodeling. Uh, uh, what? You were talking about remodeling. The yeah. dining room was yes. remodeling. Well, they I mean, did how was the financial situation for both of you? How was the financial situation back then? And who were were you hiring people to do the work? Or I know there's the Pelicans. Were the Pelicans the main group doing a lot of the? Construction or just upkeep in the bar? Or how, uh, in the club. How, how did that was repaired? Internally, tell us about the Pelicans. Uh, Howard Folker ran the Pelicans, and internally, as far as the clubhouse, I uh, I'm not aware that most of the work that I was involved with uh, was the harbor. Okay. And for instance, all that seawall where the cyclone fence is now. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did all that. Uh, uh, the pilings were in there, but but as I recall, we put the forms in and, and encased it in uh, and and uh, poured concrete around the poles because they were all kind of leaning out. Now next door, what they did is they put cables around them and then rent, trenched it in the parking lot about 50, 60 feet and then anchored them in the parking lot so they wouldn't. Uh, fall outboard from the seems to be working <laughs> yeah. well you know they did a lot of things right over there I, I my neighbor was Roger Eldridge so I I, I kind of kept up with how things were going over there right but anyway that was uh, getting back to my my time with as vice commodore uh, it was really not my forte I would really have preferred to be uh, in uh, a, a rear counter and handing the sailing because this is uh, when I was more uh, familiar with things in in the 80s. I spent a lot of time here uh, with the uh, racing programs. Uh, I was uh, getting the race committees put together, and so I had all race management, and then going out myself and my friends. Uh, I had a canar. I have a canar. Still have it. Oh, I've had it 49 years now. Uh, and uh, we had seven canars in the club at one time. And so we <clears throat> we talked about about racing a lot. And uh, uh, I would much have much preferred that uh, I got behind all of. Race management, and then I got into the YRA as a club delegate, uh, and then I was on the board of the YRA uh, a long time. I think I, 
I was on the board starting, I, I think I figured out, but I've been on the board about 37 years uh, before I finally retired. Um, I've been chairman for a long time, and then I started the Classic Boat Racing Association, which was uh, an offshoot of the Wooden Boat Racing Association. Anyway, um, so that was where my main interests were, and, and I had no business uh, running the, the bar in the dining room. We had bartender problems, we had chef <laughs> problems, and, and as I said before, when you when you are in the community, you know yeah. you know the people, you know the opportunities, you know who's looking. Who does what? Yes, yeah. Yeah. but uh, it was all a yeah. big vacuum. So Robert, how about you? Would, was it the same thing that attracted you to the club uh, racing initially, or uh, when I joined up uh, in 1964, I was sailing with Don McRae, who was a friend of mine for high school, and we brought in one of the first uh, uh, what a Cal 20 from LA. The mast was a little taller than what they. And before we knew it, we were hanging on the side all the time. And finally got out of that and went into a golden gate, uh, which is like a baby bird. And we sailed that for a few years. And then an American NAR. And then finally Polly, a uh, bird boat. So we had a pretty good... And then after a while, we joined up uh, with a um, trip with what the hell that was the boat. It was a Triton, like Ed White's Wade's boat. And we sailed that for two to three hours, or uh, years, I mean. So on that, and then basically when I graduated from college, my parents gave me a boat uh, to have my own. So that's when I officiated, being 1964, and that's when I got the boat. So I had that for about three to four years, five years. So when, you, so when you became a member, was that sort of like Bob? Was that, oh, here well, I am as a member, or did you go through anything formal or? Well, when you have a boat in the harbor, you have to join us. <laughs> so you have the same. Same thing, the same, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Before Don was paying the bill, but it was not a big deal. I mean, it was like peanuts in comparison to now. Yeah. But, uh, and we raced in all the witties and all that type of thing, and the canars, birds, or golden gates weren't for any money of them at that time. In, in those days, were slip, slips readily available, or was there, like we have now, a waiting list? When I came in in 58, there were seven Monterey fishermen on D line in the first close to the parking lot. And then there's more club members got boats, they moved out, and finally they were all gone. Mm -hmm. We had one left on E-Line, uh, I think uh, George... Haggard? Haggard. George Haggard. Yeah, he was, uh, he was the one that was right. left. Yeah. And uh, his home. He was a historian <laughs> himself. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, so when, when the two of you came in, the, when you were in the harbor, when you came in, you were saying as more and more members got boats. Yes. So was that the members that were here first and then they got boat, or was it the other way around? I'm not quite sure. I think it was so sure. you knew. Yeah, I, I, what you're asking is that did members join up and then have a boat and came in, or did they have, did they buy a boat that were already members? And right. I, And I would, just take a guess that uh, they probably were new members that brought a boat in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. of, okay. On that part. The, 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 the club was not uh, strong financially <laughs> in those years. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yeah. the financial Financial situation. Well, I think that uh, the, the board uh, Having been on the board and, as I said, secretary for a while and whatnot in my early years, uh, the board tried to 
come up with a billing on verse that was averages different harbors. So they had a committee that investigated all that, and supposedly we were uh, competitive uh, in pricing. It, it wasn't a big deal as far as giving the members a big deal, and it wasn't uh, uh, real cheap either. But anyway, the point is that I think that, it, that the mistake that they, was made is that in the membership uh, fees and, and, and entry fees, they had, they had uh, what you would be familiar with, we had, uh, we had membership drives and you, mm -hmm. we gave memberships away cheaply and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And I think that that, that affected us negatively. Uh, Instead of charging thirty grand like the Peninsula Tennis Club does to join, right? Um, they were coming in at their cheap prices. Was there ever ever any instance when they had to perform deferred maintenance and they didn't have the money that they they assessed? Were members ever assessed? Oh. Um, I think there were a couple of assessments, if I recall correctly, but I, yeah, not, not much this to really thing. talk yeah. about. Yeah. I mean. When I came on treasurer, I've been on the board for four years and then became secretary and then treasurer. And at that time, which I think was in the mid 80s, uh, the club was in debt to Southern Wine and Spirits at a clip of around $30,000. Wow. And our bottom line was terrible. So one, I called the vice president of of Southern Wine and Spirits in Florida, and I was with Seabrook at that time. I was time. going to say, you're in the industry. That, right. that, was, that was good fortune. Well, I just told him, I said, you have to give me 45 days terms. And he had a stroke. And I said, uh, either that or I'll raise, I'll cut your percentage of support dollars that you have going with us right now. So it worked and got what we needed. But the club was in deep trouble. I mean, we were talking in these days, uh, mid-80s, we're talking somewhere around seventy, seventy-two thousand dollars $72,000 in the hole. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of money in those days. Mm -hmm. So we corrected everything because, frankly, the dining room was, and I'm not kidding you, the dining room was going out upstairs, I'm sorry, ballroom, upstairs, went out for about 80 bucks a night, mm -hmm. plus $40 to clean up. Mm -hmm. I took it immediately from 40 or $80 to 500 and then had a cleanup fee and then we started gradually taking the operation up and we had a limitation of what we could do by the dollars of revenue from the bar and the dining room. So by the time we got through in four years we had gone from 80 to $5,000. Uh, for initiation, being able to use the room, plus the, you know, food and everything else right. that went with it. The other was the fact that uh, the club had a lot of issues that continued, went on, in regards to what they were buying. They had wines where, when I think it was John and Roz Culver, we were having dinner, and the waitress came up to us, said, we have a wonderful bottle of Cabernet we'd like to sell you. And my wife was there, who doesn't drink, as you know. And I said, okay, what do you have? And it's $108 a bottle. In, in the 80s? In the 80s. Wow. And I, I, did, I just said, thank you very much. And then I got a hold of the you know, House Committee and saying, what the hell are you doing with it? And how much do you have in the bottom uh, storage room? Because obviously they, and right now, are doing the same thing where they have these very expensive wines and they're doing nothing because nobody is going to sailors are the cheapest people in the world when it comes to buying food and wine <laughs> after their fees and everything else that goes on so you have to my nickname at C here and it's at uh, Seagram's was Lord Turnscrew <laughs> and you know I did it because we had to get ourselves because California law for liquor bills have to be paid within 40 days. Wow. And God help you if you don't. Right. And then you're on cash. So, so when did you see 
I mean, I, I remember a mm -hmm. lot of stuff too, but I'm not the one that's over there right now. But when would you say that the turnaround was financially... Um, I mean, I remember all the way up to about year 2000, we were in trouble, so to speak. And I'm not sure when the turnaround... Uh, well, actually, we, we've gone up and down like a year ago, mm -hmm. because of the fact that as, as you looked at what was required, people coming in after me had no idea about how much wine and liquor and beer have to be paid for. And it's by California state law. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have your beer bill, if I recall correctly, because I'm really not in the beer business, but if you did not pay it off by a certain time, you couldn't get another delivery. Right. So they had to keep going this going on. Having the ballroom going up in in the fact that we could do this, we took one other step. And that was when I was treasurer to take the birthing fees for the harbor into our books. And we get 15% on top of that to be above that to be able to expand our bills and how to handle it. Thus, we also increased our liquor, wine, food, everything else, and lock lockers downstairs. And there are a lot of lockers that weren't being built. So those got built. Right. And you know, there were, you know, even though we have the Taj Mahal downstairs uh, with the bathrooms, they were paying off. Mm -hmm. It was every way we could find income coming in. What happened at the Centennial in 86? Were we too generous in giving away memberships at that time? Did that do anything? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I really don't remember that yeah. too well. Um, there, uh, there was, the idea was probably to get the cash flow in. I mean, the initiation fee isn't what it is now, and I don't remember what it would be, Bob, unless you do, as to the initiation yes, fee. Uh, the big event in 86 was on our centennial. We uh, hosted International Canar Regatta. Yes. That John Culver ran. Hmm. He was the chairman uh, of uh, everything, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and. So I, uh, my role was uh, more on the racing side as far as race management and participation. We had the, we had about 28 canards in the harbor here that were tied up on A-line. Everybody moved out to mm -hmm. make room. And so it, uh, we didn't have expenses for racing because, uh, uh, oh, what's his name from, uh, from, uh, Anchor Steam provided. Uh, oh. a Fritz Maytag. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was he was a, r r related somewhere in the Canar fleet with with an interest in this. So anyway, what I'm saying is, after every race, they had I don't know how many cases, twenty, a hundred, whatever, and on each finger uh, for all the. The crews, you're talking 28 by times three or four per boat, so uh, you're uh, talking about a lot of people that consumed a lot of booze. Uh, I don't remember the uh, social functions being extravagant to the point where we would have lost. No, no, no we, I don't. We covered the, uh, covered the uh, but I, I think if that's how much I know about answering your question, Mike. My responsibilities and interests are most in the racing side. Yeah, yeah. We did one other thing, which was the Jack Daniels regattas. Do you recall those? No. That's where we had boats that were brought in from San Diego down from Washington, depending on the class boats that we had. And keep in mind, I was working for Seagram's at the time, and I had to call Brofman as I said, would you like to do the like he does the Mums Cup, he said, no way in hell am I going to pay for that here on the West Coast. I said, okay, Jack Daniels wants to do it. Have them spend the money. And so we put that on for about two to three years, and it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think it was, we had two or three different stations that went on. 
So I think we were fairly active in different saline things that perhaps we're not now. What? The two of you, speaking of sailing events, or big sailing events, both of you is on, in my little booklet from 1991 when we hosted the Adams Cup um, regatta. And that was an all-female right. uh, uh, qualifying from across the country, so it was a national regatta. And I, I, I have my little booklet. You were the race chair, and you were, you know. Probably on the deck. And do you remember that? Oh, yes, vividly. Okay, tell us about it, because that was a big event. That was actually <laughs> a huge event. Well, we had uh, a lot of interest in the club, uh, and uh, we also had a lot of people from next door that we, by people I mean women, who were involved. Uh, and uh, uh, I had dinner uh, last week with one of them, Anne McCormick. Uh, uh, so this was a community effort and it was a lot of fun because the women really uh, participated and I just loaded them up with everything. I just, I, I, they ran the races and so on and so forth. So it was, uh, it was uh, ensuring that communications were the, the big item because we had all these, each, air, each uh, US YRU at that time area in the country, I don't know how many there were, eight to 10? The 10. Um, I sent a representative here, so we had all these people from all over the country and using boats that were donated. And I'm trying to remember, wasn't it in Lightnings? I think it was Solings. Pardon? Solings. Solings. Oh, I, I must be thinking of another regatta then. But anyway, we provided all the boats. Uh, so it was a matter of gathering volunteer boats for people who were going to race, yeah. which, which is like giving off your, your oldest fourth generation champagne glasses for somebody else to use in a wild party. Uh, so it was uh, interesting, but it was uh, just a lot of fun. The women really appreciated the special treatment that they got from us, and uh, I just enjoyed myself. At, at, at that time, I think you said 1991, uh, I sort of lost track when we went through sort of a tantric shift. Uh, um, <clears throat> would this been one of the uh, earlier uh, all-female regattas held up out here? Was, there, was, was this at all I remember. a pioneering uh, effort? Too. We got the, this regatta was something that Linda Corrado fought for back at the national headquarters. Uh, Linda was a, was a Canar sailor at one time. She owned 140. Uh, and uh, I, I still see her. I take her out to dinner once or twice a year and say hello. Uh, so you, were, you it's all about relationships in this game. And uh, uh, the women participated because they realized that it was their sole regatta, and all you had to do was ask, and they just volunteered. And we got a lot of help from next door. I, I, I think I, we, we got we got a lot of help from everybody in the club. It's amazing well, to see how the club, males and females, pull together yeah, to to, yeah. to 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 oh, make yeah. this a successful event. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember that. The press was here, the, the cameras were rolling. I mean, this was a big thing. John and we all did it. There was John no John was heavily involved, yeah. and Rosalind, of course. And they had a canard, so I, I know them. I'm still very close to them. Uh, but uh, the point is that it was uh, well attended by the club. The club was very supportive. We had a, uh, a final dinner. Uh, for them, and uh, and uh, the interesting thing of the regatta is that the the practice uh, was to have a, a 
judging boat with judges from all over the country. So they were there to officiate. They they called everything. They in effect ran ran the number of races and things like that. And we we sailed over in the Circle area, Southampton, uh, <coughs> and uh, I had a number of of uh, nice race committee boats to work off of. And, uh, I'm not sure what my role was on the water, but uh, I remember that uh, I sat down with a whole group of people here and, and organizing. It was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, it, because of the relationships, uh, it was it was more like a party than a regatta. At, at, at that time, did we have many female members of the club that came in not necessarily being married or having a spouse. I'm trying to get a sense of when there was a time when that just didn't happen. And then... Well, it's it, only in the 60s. Right, right. But by the time by we got into the 80s and the 90s, would you... Would you had to. Yeah. I think taking you back a little bit, when I was on the board in the 60s, there was a big discussion as to whether they would allow women members. Right. They had, they had established a woman's auxiliary, which is fine with the men, uh, and they could play all they wanted. So the, we had no, I don't recall any conversations where we wanted to restrict what the women were doing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I'm not sure when women were allowed in, into membership. In the mid-70s. Mid-70s. Mid well, the, the federal laws board. came in to saying that women had the right to join a club. Right. Yeah. And this was true on the East Coast as well as it was on the West Coast. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you go to Boston and all that, yeah. it was amazing the number of clubs that the Great Eastern Yacht Club yeah. in Marblehead. At Marblehead, I think it was used in the around the world in 80 days when they did the wing back chairs and all the rest oh, of the monkey okay. business. One other thing that we did do was uh, this Coronado 25 that I had, we put on a national race and we had about 20, 25 boats here in the bay. And I sent them out on a Friday as a test race <coughs> so they could get a little feel for the bay. And I said, you will come back afterwards and tell us what you wanted. And it was a fairly decent win, you know, close to the 25, somewhere in there. And they came back and one guy stood up and said, you don't need a good boat, you don't need a good crew, what you need is a priest. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those fun things. Was, and I think that's what Corinthian needs to get back to, is getting back to races where people really enjoy what they have and the class keeps changing right you know i, I, I was going to ask you that i got in a number of years ago with someone we both know a rather a, a big racer and a rather heated discussion about how this this club has no interest in being a racing club it's lost all of that and uh um you know i'm not being a, a racer or a sailor uh uh still, you know, knowing a lot of people that do, I think the uh, people seem to enjoy it. But I mean, what's your perspective of, of where the Corinthian is right now from a, from a racing standpoint? I'll let you answer first because I know what I'm going to say. Well, I think that like most things in the club, everything depends on communication. And the officers you have in the club that are responsible for racing has got to speak up. Uh, and you have to have people that realize our shortfalls and what they're going to do about it, like any manager would do of a large organization. Uh, I say that because uh, when I became, when I was younger <laughs> and uh, was more involved with the people, as I mentioned before, in the dining room you had to know the community uh, and what the general feeling was in the community so you're not figuring that you have to roll this race by yourself, that you're going to have a lot of help mm -hmm. and everything is a function of, of participation mm -hmm. by everybody mm -hmm. and so I, uh, my 
main activity in racing was in the early 80s to 1995, somewhere around there. Uh, I, and you have people around here that was were heavy participants, like Jim Snow comes to my mind. Uh, if I needed a guy out there to set marks and pick him up, Jim Snow mm -hmm. would be there. And so I, I, I had a program going within the club, but I also was on the board of the YRA and, and determined that what we needed was a lot of race management education. So I set up a program and uh, we had uh, uh, experts in various aspects of race management. And I remember on our first uh, seminar, we had over 200 people that attended at the clubs because the sophistication of race management people in the clubs was very thin. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. You that know. was in the clubs. Yes. I mean, clubs in the around clubs. the bay. Yeah. And uh, uh, the YRA's function is to support race in the bay. So I felt at home and I knew the community and I had all kinds of friends that, that were experts in race management uh, all the way down to uh, Howard, what's his name? <laughs> Howard and Edna. Howard Folka. Howard Folka? Yeah, he... Uh, Folka? No. no. She was the uh, chairman of, uh, or the secretary for the Small Boat Racing Association, so she was a big supporter and her husband was a big supporter. So I had experts from mm -hmm. all the clubs, uh, uh, about eight of them at this. It was a two-day deal. And uh, because there was a vacuum in the clubs as to uh, people that were sophisticated enough and interested enough to spend the time to teach. Mm -hmm. It was all teaching because there was no pros on this. USYRU at that time was ineffective. They had no national programs. Now they got all kinds of national programs and are telling the clubs what they have to do, which is all wrong because they, they set up all the rules and, and they tell the clubs this is the way it's got to be done in the clubs. Now, for instance, I was talking to somebody next door. Uh, they need a, to have somebody with a current U.S. sailing uh, certification in order to run a major regatta, oh and they got they got people with all kinds of experience that could do that, but they don't have that certification. The certification, yeah. You know? That's the change. Yeah. Yeah. The change in time. It, it's called it's called centralization run amok. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but anyway, uh, getting back to our subject, that uh, uh, I. I I set up a couple of programs here to get it going, and uh, and we had a formal way of, of uh, handling this. Uh, at that time, the Apple IIe came into uh, existence in 1983, and I remember going to the first classes up in uh, up in Novato uh, at uh, Marin JC. Anyway, uh, Sylvia and I uh, went to the classes, and we learned how to run this beast because it was really unknown and and you really had no f feeling of the real potential. So but I, you, I think, probably could really appreciate it coming from the world of the IBM Selectric, yeah. which was sort of your precursor to... Well, what I was going to do yeah. is tell you how I used it which in race management, and that is a, that we had a, a criteria on how to, to uh, become a good race manager, and, and so we we put that into uh, a formal form and and distributed to all the clubs and say, we got this program, certified race officer, and you do all these things, that we call them activities, and as you do them, you send them into my house, and my wife, Sylvia, entered them all into the computer, and when you got all 10 or whatever, you are certified. You are certified and you got a badge okay. and a certificate, a certificate that I signed. Uh, so we had this program going and then and then I, because I was an area race officer here to USYRU for four years 
and and they'd heard about our program, and so when I went back to their annual meetings, they asked me to talk about it. And so lo and behold, a couple of years later, they came out with their own program. They pinched it. And I said, <laughs> and I said, just call when they're certified. Call them anything but a CRO because we said certified race officer. So they came out with their own club race officer. Oh. oh. Okay. Well, what's happened to the club itself as far as yeah. its image in regards to racing? Mm -hmm. I remember one time where the race chairman put, he was supposed to be on the boat, but he wasn't. He was turned over to another person like an hour and a half before the boat was leaving. So they went out there, this is about 2010, and went out to start the race, I'm sorry, uh, later, back back up from that, maybe 10 years ago, whatever the hell it is mm -hmm. at this point. But the point is, is that... Was this in the committee boat? Yep. Mm -hmm. And we were doing class racing, mm -hmm. and the, all of the orders, all the information, how to start the boat, the poor guy who was suddenly on deck had no clue what the hell was coming off, and it ruined, it really knocked our reputation. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have much of a reputation anymore, it, it might right or wrong, Bob, when you think well, it about it. depends our, upon what decades you're talking about. Well, I'm talking now. Now. You know, well, now. now we're thin, and we have no formal program of teaching people, which, which I think is the way you, it performs several functions. One is you get the members to know each other, with a, that have a common interest, and so we get them involved and we teach them. If you teach them as to what's expected, instead of grading them without telling them what right. to do. Uh, so we, it's how you run things and I'm not involved in that anymore. Would, would, would you say the distinction is there's a big difference between running a race and hosting a race? Well, there are two things really before, when you're looking at the class boats that are out there, uh -huh. they're shrinking. The wooden boats are shrinking down because of maintenance. The glass boats, like the NARS, that kind of thing. But the other aspect is, the, let's say you now live in Tiburon for the sake of argument. So you're probably looking at a $1.5 million house. You're taking Junior off to grammar school. That's $32,000 for that. You start taking the next one, and that's still 32000 So you begin to look at what is going yeah, on nice. with the club. So we try to do kayak pop and up standing up paddleboard speed, you know, races that we would get into. And the problem was is that they could come out, do it, enjoy it, and it's not expensive. Mm -hmm. They could also join the club with a special, you know, regatta type of membership that we can bring them in mm -hmm. on so that we can do these regattas. We did fairly well. I think we did about 32, 34 boats or kayaks, that type of stuff that were going out. And it got lost in the race committee as I dropped back because I was in the middle of a major acquisition in my wine business. I couldn't do it anymore. I, you know, I just watched this whole thing go away. We didn't follow up. And we had people who love to pretend they know what the hell's going on when in reality they don't. One thing that we do do well, which we've done for a long time, is the Friday night races. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now this guy is there every Friday night. As am I. So yes. Is, see. I I do the flags with my buddy Will. Yes. Oh, Will. Yeah. Well, yes, you do. Yeah. He's still doing that. Yep. He still is. And yeah, the kid. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> the uh, kid. <laughs> uh, it's a popular program, but. The last time I, I helped on the race deck was, uh, I'd estimated about two-thirds of the boat were from next door. Yes. We are putting the race on for them. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't yeah. realize that, <coughs> that disparity. Oh, yes. It, we need well, to... That was my observation at the no. time. I, I only did it for a couple of weeks, so I, I'm just speaking from... He's got current experience. I've got past. Uh, yeah. Well, he's got past also, but I, I'm more past. <laughs> Well, basically, when you look at A-Line, there's hardly a sailboat in there. I was going to say, we've, 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 our, our composition of boat types has changed. It used to be half and half on A-Line at least. Yeah. Well, even the full har harbor is almost 50-50 or maybe even more in power. Uh -huh. 
My question would be, is powerboat racing still going on? Yeah. Predicted log or any of that stuff? No. Yeah, they, no? no. Uh, Not out here, be, at least. Not they used here. to have their own organization. And, yeah, we did some. Yeah. We yeah. did some running for them. Yeah. But our, our, they got the damn computer that helps them navigate this day and age. But are yeah, we interested in it or what? As you well know, I've, I've said on some Friday night race <laughs> races where the boats are going faster backwards and forwards. And I'd <laughs> love to get the megaphone out and say, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines and uh, have a powerboat sailboat race. But um, how, what, it, because you have experienced this where we, we, we did have a robust program, mm -hmm. how, how, in your estimation, can we get this happening again? You need to create a, a certain committee or is that something that a committee should take on? And I also realize it's somewhat a function of who's on the flag as well, I would imagine. I think that uh, everything stems from communication in large organizations. The people the problem. don't know unless you say something. And I, of course, I'm not, this is the first one I've seen in over a year. Um, I'm, I'm 91. And uh, unless I get, a, an, I'm not down here in the bar every Friday nights. And uh, unless I get something at home, I don't know what's going on. And uh, I, when I was younger uh, and out of the game, so to speak, uh, although I race, still raced my boat uh, up until a year or two ago, uh, I never was asked to help, even though I had all this. But the people change, and you have to be aware of the changes that you have a consistency in communication with the membership because if nobody's asks, they're not going to volunteer for something they don't know about. Right. I, I, and it's all about volunteering. I think you're hitting on a, on a very good point. Mm -hmm. It is that between you know, us existing members, newer members coming in, um, yes, there has to be more communication. There also has to be more communication as to w w who do we have as Senior members and, your and ask, yeah, yeah, and ask our senior members to be involved versus yes. always thinking about, oh, we got to get the new members involved. Right. Well, you do, but you have to. The experience is there, so at least they can guide. No, and you, you have to have somebody to ask. That's true. And if they're not asked, and if you tell them we need your help, and they say, oh, geez, I really I don't know anything about racing, they said, we'll teach you. And that's, that's why I ran classes here, but I'm talking about the 80s. Right, I was right, heavy in this, right. so it's, it's a different era. You have, I think we had a different audience at that time, and I knew the people. Now, I can't offer any well, help. Well, why this is important is our committee, you know, the History and Artifacts Committee, that's one of the reasons why we're having these these conversations because there's a legacy to this club but if if there's a if there's a, a domino falls out of place you could easily lose sight of what that legacy is so one of the things we want to capture you know uh, through these conversations is what is that legacy and make making people aware of something they didn't otherwise no. And that's how you're going to sustain that through the generations. And I think, you know, there was sort of a, a quiet period there where we didn't have that. And now capturing this, um, obviously we want to hear what it used to be like, but uh, it's also important as we piece these different conversations together, we'll see the evolution. And we, we don't want somewhere along the line to sort of hit a wall in that evolution because we, you know, we, we weren't aware of the past and just how rich a story that we have. You have to take your story to the uh -huh. board of directors because you hit a lot of key points of what is not being done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot not being done. 
Well, and I think that when we complete this, that's probably something our committee will want to do. Uh, well, and, uh, uh, I'll give it to you. I don't, for instance, you ask about racing, and uh, I don't ever remember seeing anything about Thank you. a call for help, a call for training, none of this. It's right. just, and um, I, it's, it, it, without pinning fault on anybody, uh, sure. Perhaps that's just an illustration of the lack of demand. Yeah, and that that it's yeah. The whole idea is not to not to place blame to play the blame game or anything, but just to heighten awareness. Sure. And uh, there's a lot of people that engaged in in racing that started knowing nothing. But we also have, I think, a wealth of pretty knowledgeable people around here. Yeah, that some are more controlling than. Yeah, that, that is, you have that's to, your problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you can't get combination of how to put on a regatta and all this is monkey business that has been going on, not you. You know what I'm talking about. No, I it's, don't. I, 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 when you when you get two people who are in charge of the race committee, and things are put on the way they want to put it on. Oh, and yet I'm they disappear. A, that's current stuff, and I'm not aware of current stuff. Well, I guess. we might as well get the facts of the current. <coughs> you just enjoy it. No, it, it's this little thing that's not so little called ego on the part of some yes. people. Yes. And, well, and everything that's going through of, is like the Vatican. That's the function you of have to manage a firecracker it. under your rear Commodore. Oh, He's yeah. the one that's supposed to drive all this. This is more stuff. time than you guys were thinking. Yeah. You know, well, well uh, related to that, I mean, your, your question, we're now past an hour. Of, believe it or not, of, of sitting here having this conversation, and um, we have to edit this down so that we can handle it. Point being, uh, we're approaching the end, and what I would like to hear from each of you is the most memorable story you have from the club. When your grandkids come up and say, what do you remember about the Corinthian? Do you have a story? of, you know, the time you punched out the Commodore, or the uh, race officer Which was one? taken away by the police. <laughs> or Which time? I mean, <laughs> we have lots of time. Have you a story? Tell them all. <laughs> Once upon a time. I think that my biggest impressions are, uh, as far as memorable events, and events that I enjoyed, is, uh, are the regattas that I was the regatta chairman. And one of them is the women's. Uh, uh, and, and that was uh, a memorable event for several reasons. One is we had a packed dining room up there, including our judges from all around the country. And the other one was that I was sitting next to a table where somebody started smoking and somebody objected. And uh, uh, Peter Hogg and I were, we broke up a potential fight out in, <laughs> so, over smoking. So, you know, these are things that stick in my mind. <laughs> that was, I don't know when that women's regatta was, but I, was, I remember the... 1991. That's the end. That's the first and last. As far as oh. a big regatta like that, yeah, yeah. that was the... This and is the one that Linda Corrado uh, put well, together. Why we, afterwards. Now, incidentally, afterwards. a point on that. Linda Corrado had to sell that program to the USYRU board and fought for it, and that's how we got it. We didn't get it because they thought we were a key. But anyway, that it's your question, what's the most memorable... Uh, I've got so damn many memories, Len, of this club. <laughs> and they probably go back to the times when I uh, was part of the uh, people that ran the club, uh, as far as my efforts in racing and so forth. Uh, and these were clearly the big regattas they put on here. Uh, John Culver was a regatta chairman for our centennial regatta in 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had another one in 1995, and Bill Brimmer, I think, was uh, Commodore. 
And I just remember those regattas because they were important events. They uh, uh, were fun for a lot of people, and uh, and I enjoyed myself. So that was what that, that was. That's your that was my memory. memory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Robert. Ah. I hate to say it, but I think we're losing our way in the regards to regattas, and that I say that because of the fact that we're not getting the harbor itself. I don't even know if we have enough of even four or five boats of the same class. So trying to pick up the canards, the ICs, maybe they're passe at this point. <laughs> and there may be, well, another plastic boat that's coming out and sailing. But I think we need to get ourselves back to a real racing committee, not the kind that's been handling the last few week, uh, months and weeks and years. And I, I know it because I can, I've been up there on that deck. It's not the people on the deck. It's the lack of communication from the club to the, to the different fleets that are out there. Why don't we participate in the nationals of that given group or Bay Area, whatever? If we can haul with the Jack Daniels, we can haul boats from Seattle, from Southern California coming in, all one design boats, because you want to make your life completely crazy. But we can do these things, and we're not. We're letting it slip through, and everybody's going, passing the buck as far as I'm concerned. Now, I want to go back to an event, something that was fun, where you were laughing. <laughs> what do you laugh? remember as a, yeah, a big standout event. It doesn't have to be a party, but just something that happened. I can Well, remember. one race we had, which was... No, I don't remember. <laughs> so, remember what? all the dinghy derbies? The dinghy derbies. Dinghy derbies. <laughs> How much beer was put in the boat? That was, that was a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the one where we were going across the bay with no. the, in an El Toro? Anyway. Yeah, that was the El Toro's, yes. With umbrellas. Yeah, with those big that. ships bow in the middle of it. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> but what do you remember as fun? A big, fun sort of oh, I think we've had, getting together. You know, going, going up to the Vallejo race was a lot of fun. I took the Coronado with John and Roz and Warren Vincent, mm -hmm. and they went traipsing across the smart marsh ground, where in the hell it was, because there was a big Ferris wheel and all the rest, and they went to get some liquor and brought it back. And my boat looked like big footprints all over the deck and in below everything else. Fun racing. I don't think anybody remembered the second part of the race going home, but those kinds of races, or having national races that we can for a fleet of boats that are in vogue, and I don't pretend to know whose boats are in vogue anymore. I don't think there are very many of the smaller boats. Are there, Bob? No. The uh, SBRA disappeared with Edna, and uh, I don't know of any SBRA boats on the bay. You know, these are boats in the 15, 17 foot range. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what about the folk boats? I, I've, I've enjoyed just the fact that we've got some international competition and all of that, are do you view that even there that we're not doing that as well as we are not? We should have. Uh, we did it with NARS. Mm -hmm. um, I think I don't know how well the NAR fleet is doing at this point. Um, obviously, the wooden boats are probably pretty well gone, aren't they? At I've got one in the harbor. I know, but I mean, one for sale. But, yeah, but it's up for Just sale. But I mean, yeah. Are are not are NARS still being made? Oh yes. Oh, yeah. Are they brought but, brought in? But that, that's another factor that I'm sure everybody's aware of, and that is that to where you could pick up a canard for five grand uh, back when. Now they're a hundred and ten. Yeah. Right. Right. Made in Germany. Right. And they aren't even made in Denmark anymore. Which was, mine was made in Oslo. It was that the was real the deal. One. And then they went. They sold part of their rights to uh, a builder, Borison, in uh, Copenhagen, next to near Copenhagen. It's two islands away. Uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, I think that, uh, that there's a general knowledge of of uh, those among the racers that that the racing is becoming much more expensive than it was. Uh, the availability of new classes. When I got into the YRA back in 1970, uh, we were we were starting a new class about every year or two, and you had to join the uh, uh, the what do they call it the the, with all the, the range of different boats in it, there was a big there was a big uh, organization in there. What do they call it? Mm -hmm. Well, there were the Rick one design, Rick. and then the the other one was the PHR. And so you had to it, to come into one design, you had to have uh, X number of boats. I think five or seven boats that raced fifty percent of their races in in the HDRA, and then you became a class. So we'd be opening a class uh, or two every year. Mm -hmm. And that was a function of all these new fleets that are coming up from from Southern California, builders. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember that famous building grounds uh, down there. But anyway, the point is that that the the volume and the the acceleration or speed of, of the introductions has dropped dramatically. And now Bob's talking about boats that he's familiar with, I'm familiar with, like the folk boats. Mm -hmm. Do you mention the idea? That's all passe. It's all now right. it's the That's J right. this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the J's now are it's... coming out like automobiles with yeah. new classes and, and they're fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's what the kids like, and they're willing to spend the money, and because they're built in big productions, they can hold the price down. Well, they got to have volume to have price. Yeah, as was the America's Cup here. They were they weren't boats; those were airplanes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So well, anyway, the, 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 you can't you can't stop progress. Uh, right. And and the boats that used to come in. In, in great quantities were the the 19 to 25 footers, mm -hmm. which is 27 foot, and then 30 and then 32. Mm -hmm. Probably my phone and I don't care. So, is that the uh, closing uh, bell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, gentlemen, I'm sorry, we're coming up on four o'clock, really? an hour and a half, so we're going to have to close this down. Okay, there's one we've thing. Got, one thing more history regards. than you ever wanted. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing for the power boats in regards to racing? We used to do it. Predictive log, et cetera, like that. Is there any interest in that? Well, you know, we, we're, we have a, a new Commodore coming in who <laughs> has been a racer. Okay. And I think it's someone we should have that conversation. You know, every whether they say it or not, every... Every Commodore that comes in wants to leave with their imprint, with their imprint, their imprimatur, uh, you know, their handprint on what they did. Right. And maybe this is a this is not a bad topic to start with, just my, as a thought. My suggestion there, in re relative to that conversation, is uh, to ensure that uh, that he communicates needs and desires and objectives to the memberships because let's face it uh, our club is not the premier racing club on the bay and why is it that richmond and st francis have these big programs and we don't you've got to have a potential there but you got to you got to communicate with them in order to see if you have one or can develop one. throughout this conversation today uh, the operative word has been communication. I think that that's become very clear. And sure. As one who used to write the crier, and, and and if it's done properly, you get this out, and it's not just a bulletin ah. board of things. Yeah, what I get, I look at the crier. It tells me what I'm, when they're going to have parties. And, uh... Yeah. So uh, we we probably have people. If they knew about it, they would respond. And we're getting younger people in this club as well. And that's the other thing that, you know, that's not always popular in certain clubs, but at the end of the day, that's part of your legacy. You know, we're all getting older, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's also a function of, uh, 
knowing your community, as I mentioned, about the, the dining room <laughs> and the cooks and whatnot, that I don't know, I don't know what the potential is out there uh, as far as racers or people. I, I started racing on a boat next door. So you got to develop an interest and then grow the interest. Well, and in some instances, there may be people here where as a kid they sailed with their, with their family, and then they got busy raising a family, didn't have a boat, or whatever reason, and so it sort of went on hold. And uh, so, you know, again, you don't know if you don't ask, and actually today there were two C words, community and communication, that, that came across throughout. So. You need to look at the market that you're playing with. I mean, Tiburon, Mill Valley, two, three million dollar homes that are cracked, private schools, all the rest of it. We need to figure out either kayaks or stand up surfboards or whatever in the hell it's going to be. To engage. Do. To engage. Yeah. Right. And bring a different level who can enter <coughs> involve with themselves with it. Yeah. So, Gentlemen. anyway. This is talking about the future, which is delightful, but I really thank you for talking about the past which is what we're very much interested in. So I thank you for your time, gentlemen. Okay. And if you don't mind, as we're putting this together, if we have additional questions, can we come back and ask you about some things? I don't sure. think we can, can we? I, 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 sure. Uh, I, I brought this uh, Pelican sweater, um, and I, I mentioned to Lynn this afternoon that uh, uh, I can take this back home, and it was always my intention to give it to him after he found a place that wasn't annually rained on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we're working on that. Yeah, we're working on that. And, and right now he's he's in the. Uh, I've never worn it. I can see it looks it looks too new. It was on the it's bottom <laughs> of my sweater. It, it was always my intention to uh, yes. give it to the club historian. Uh, but you know, I, 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 he had enough trouble keeping his stuff dry, and uh, and I told him that I'd keep it at, uh, until he needed it. But you know, if, you're welcome to. But I think well. If if I might pass away tomorrow, and uh, no, 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 no. Uh, and now you. Have it. No. Well, you want to hang on to it? Um, I can do that. Okay. I can put you, it in, you're uh, very in good about it. You, we are, well, we you bring these.